So yesterday we started at the end of the class. We arrive at this function here. Okay. In an, an analogy to quantum mechanics. Okay. Fine. So uh, this is for the non interacting theory. Okay. So this term is originally at an external field. Okay. But at the end of the day Okay. So why I put it there? Because it will be useful in a few minutes. And minutes we'll be able to calculate its scattering and all right. So let's go. So what have we done to evaluate? So we want to evaluate that. Always when the action is quadratic, okay, we can do the calculation analytically. And it proceeds by one way of doing it is to discretize the field on a lattice, space-time lattice, okay? At each point, then you have a phi, then this now is a ordinary, uh, it's like a Q, like a coordinate, okay? And so the I stands for X and time, okay? And uh, actually, uh, I is for indices right because it's x y z and the time okay so everything is lumped together so we don't need to get very specific about that and not to put too, mu too much clutter here we just put it here. then this this integral here becomes this huge integral here okay over uh, ordinary variables okay and this is of this form here you see is like phi square right and phi is similar to these gaussian integrals with a displacement so there is a trick to evalu evaluate this you have to think that you have diagonalized this thing here okay so then you get say something square here and then you complete the square and then what you get here is, is the uh, the eigenvalues of that the answer is one over product of eigenvalues that is the origin of the determinant okay and what enters here is one over the eigenvalue one over is the inverse of this matrix here okay so this is the the result and this is independent of j all j dependence is here it's like this in uh, b x here okay is a constant with respect to b is simply uh, one over square root of a e to the b square okay so this doesn't depend this term here doesn't depend on b and this is what is of j okay so then coming back only interesting is this one for us okay as you will see in a few minutes okay so now it's very trivial now so we continue the continue I have a constant respect to and then this is the exponent there so I call here D being the inverse of this matrix here you will see why I call it Z in a few minutes too okay and so I want first I have to solve the problem here in the this thing here because that enters here is this one you see here 
This is the matrix. This part here, this and this. Ah, this not. Th this is out already. The I is here, one half is here. So this is the matrix. Okay. I have to invert that. Okay. Probably you have done an exercise similar to that. This is to solve Green's functions. Okay. It's how you solve the Green's function in the scattering ampli uh, for calculating that scattering amplitude in quantum mechanics or in electromagnetism also to find the value. Okay. Solve this is you and here the Fourier transform of D and, and, and delta. Plug this into here. Up and hit the exponential and get from here. Hit my there. Okay. And then I put everything and I get this integral being zero. Okay. So for this to be zero, it means this is zero. Okay. So D is 1 over that thing. But there is a dangerous thing here, that this can go to 0. Okay. So to avoid this 0, we put one, 1 plus epsilon. Okay. Just to be on the safe side. Why cannot it be minus I epsilon, if epsilon positive? To give the wrong answer with respect to causality and things like that. I don't have time to explain. It's simply if we go to the light cone, it simply grow and by the light cone, this could not uh, the propagator, <laughs> as we will explain, okay? And so the particle will propagate outside the, the, the light cone. So it's a th this has a physical meaning, meaning, okay? It's a boundary condition have to solve this equation under boundary conditions. Okay. And just closing your eyes, doing the calculation, it means that actually put a my, my uh, plus i epsilon there. Okay. I, I don't have time to go further into that. Right. So once I have d tilde, I can find my operator here. Put it back uh, here. Integrate over k zero first using contour technique, yeah? because this here k square is k naught square minus k square. Okay. So you open this up here, and you make this four dimensions. This integral, this integral d k zero, d three k, two pi. 2 pi cube. Okay. D3 there remains there. there. Now, when you integrate over Q, okay, you will find then there is a pole here and a pole here. When you extend this to the complex plane, this Cauchy system and all that that you you might know. Do the K naught integral, and you arrive at this answer here. Okay, epsilon is gone. You see, epsilon is gone. I, I just use it to make this uh, contour integral. Okay, this is precisely I epsilon here. So I integrate and then put epsilon equal to zero at the end of the day. And this. Yeah, here. I think it was there, right? Or I simply forgot to put it. Yeah, are the sum of two terms. Okay, this one plus that one. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Thank you. And I have to close it here. <laughs> okay. Our inverse of this propagator here. Ah, sorry. Of this operator. 
this is that object there. Okay. This data is the heavy side function or the step function which is given by time. Okay. All right. Now the amazing thing is the following. So first, what is the interpretation of this object? Okay. The amazing thing, exercise here that you can do it in one hour or two hours is the following. This you already know, right? From a free field free field theory, you know that you you have this solution here. Okay? So if you calculate this object here, dividing expectation value of this time ordered product of this field defined like that, where the time ordering is given by that. If x, if the time component here is larger than that one, is this product. If the time component is smaller than that, then is given by this product. Do the algebra here. Okay, because at the end of the day you have to calculate things like that. A, 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 A dagger in the vacuum. And this you know, harmonic oscillator uh, algebra. Okay, it's the only complicated thing you have to do in evaluating that. At the end of the day, you get precisely this thing here. So what is the physical meaning of that? Look at phi here. Phi has a creation operator here. Okay? So when this phi here hits vacuum, what it does? Creates a particle at y. Okay? At the space-time y. Now later, you hit it with another phi. It can create another particle there, okay? But because you have the vacuum, this, this thing will be zero. Zero, a dagger k, a dagger k prime, zero. This is zero, okay? So what one will do when you sandwich with the vacuum? What? Only the a that contributes. The a dagger doesn't contribute. So then, this one creates a particle at y, and this one annihilates the particle at x. And tells me about propagation properties for a particle, say, from y to x. Okay? That is the reason it's called propagator. And how do I see this more or less? You see here? There is a pole here. What is this pole? This pole is k square equal m square. What is that? This is k naught square equal k square plus m square. And what is that? Energy square is equal k square. This relation a propagating particle. The particle with mass has this energy momentum relation. Pole of propagator gives you the dispersion or the energy as as a function of the momentum of that part. So two point functions. This is a two point function. For this example, I'm doing this the non-interacting two point function. Okay, or the propagator, and given by this expression here in momentum space is given by that. Okay, fine. Now, I'll show you a trick why I've used J. Why I have used J. J from which you get propagator. How? 
propagated, propagated. What is the propagator? How, how do I get the propagator from this function? This function is like this. Differentiate with respect to times. Okay, it's constant if j equals to zero, this is zero, so the constant z of j equals to zero. I define it z, which is the beginning of our z. This is an invention, we put it j by hand. Okay. So it's our original z. Okay. And I define it I have defined this this w function here. Fine. Let's do this calculation here. And then at the end of the day, you put j equal to zero. Okay? So let's do it. I over two D for X prime D for this is only detailed calculation. Is this delta x prime minus y and this delta y prime? Okay. And you have to have the exponential here. You have to. Thank you. Fine. So how much is that? Delta, delta, a, x, i, d for x. Okay. Now I differentiate here again. Here. Okay. Here. 
and here or there is an i over 2 here <laughs> and we have to differentiate here too okay let's do first the first one the what yeah then i have changed the variable here x prime x prime and then Now I differentiate this here, not in detail. There is a minus here, right? Because so now this is see if you agree that this x minus y plus this stuff here times the derivative of this. But when I take equal to zero, this right? because j is still there. Whatever comes from here, which is a term similar to that, goes to zero. Only the first one I have to do. And I'm using here the property this this metric as we can see from here. Symmetric here. Okay. Fine. So what have you learned? You see this. <laughs> Factor 2 goes, goes away because of this and that. Okay. And we have learned that This thing here. The second derivative z of, of z of is essentially okay. Now, what is the second derivative of this? Let's come back to its definition. Oh, is phi e to the i s original plus i phi of x. Okay? So I differentiated the result of that integral here. Okay? And got the answer there. But now, instead of differentiating that with respect to, to j, I will differentiate this See if you agree with me. Okay. Repeat the calculation now, but this calculation is done with this expression here. Okay. So I have to do then delta 2, delta j of x, delta j of y, 1 over z, integral d phi e to the i s plus i j phi and this means scalar product means the integral of j with respect and, and phi okay so what happens if i differentiate twice this and put j equal to zero at the end what happens differentiate first I get a phi here. Differentiate once more, another phi. Okay, and then I put j equal to zero. This disappears. Take i d and work out for itself. I get sim d phi phi of x phi of y e to i s over z is this one which is integral d phi e to s phi ok 
Okay. D is the free propagator. It's defined in canonical terms by this time ordered product. In the path integral language, is given by this path integral here. How do I calculate this object? I couple an external source, okay? I couple an external source and differentiate twice with respect to J. To zero. And then I get the propagator. Okay? That is the trick. By now you know what is a quantum field theory. By now you are experts in can do relations you you want analytically, okay? Using this all these tricks I have shown, and you have learned that the the first is given this path integral, okay, in canonical is given by that because tonight you we'll do this exercise to show that this is actually true. Okay. And this closes the loop then from canonical quantization to the path integral. Okay, we are almost there. I can go ahead, okay? This is two fields, okay? I have two fields here. So this is a two-point function. This is properties of the part. But if I want interactions, I have two fields, two fields. It means four fields. So I need a correlation function of four field operators here. Now things get a bit more complicated, but not impossible. For free field theory, I can calculate this analytically again. Okay, how? How do I get, if I have four fields here, how do I get this? Differentiating this many times? Four times. And you get which will be relevant for scattering. Okay. Let's do it. Schematically. Right? We are doing free field theory, okay? So now I'm interested, say, in this object here. See, pi x1, pi x2, pi x3, 4. And this is 1 over z, the phi, phi of x, phi of x. Okay. <coughs> so how to evaluate that? So this thing here is one i to the fourth. Okay, and now you put zero. So this is an exercise. 
this is pretty clear, right? How how do I get that? I put here zero at the end. Okay, so I differentiate four times e to i, and will be these four fields will be here. Okay. Now, if you for integrals, you will get the following. D x1 minus x2, d x3 minus x4 plus d x1 minus x3, d x2 minus x4 plus Okay. How how you see that? Come here. Okay. You differentiate here. Okay. And are still three derivatives to be done here. Okay. So you doing the differentiations. Every time you make a differentiation up here, you get one d. Okay, the complete calculation is a mess, it's very long here. But you have to realize that at the end of the day, you put j equal to zero. Every time j uh, j remains here after you have done all the, if you differentiate here because this will give zero. So then you get all the here. You see what is happening. This result tells you why. When this action here is quadratic. This applies, okay, and I can apply for that uh, omega of j, and you see what is the result? Is that I have done this and this. You see here, I have the propagated associated with x1, x2, x1, x2, x3, x4, but they can combine x1, x3, x2, x4, which is the this one. There is a third, which is this one with this one, and this one with this one. And calculate now. Have a operation you do. If this is quadratic, if this is quadratic, you have to start making contact. You make all possible. Okay, this is the answer. You have some of, of them. No explicit calculation required. Okay. This has a name. This is Wick's theorem. It's precisely this. You have a point function, correlation function, function quadratic, and is the sum of all contractions. Very beautiful. But if this, we have an odd number of fields here. An odd number, five fields instead. Uh, always one remaining. Right? So always will be this times path integral. How much is that? An odd, right? If I have an odd number of, this gives zero. Okay, easy, right? 
This is quantum field theory, is it? Absolutely. And that's all. That there's no more no that. To calculate now correlation functions is, is only that. Well, our life is not so simple because our action is in complications enter. So they of doing the calculation when you have interactions. All right. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Okay. Only for free field theory. But now you see the trick of perturbation theory. So it calculate correlation for free of free field theory is very easy. Go to an interacting theory. When you have an interaction. S of phi is S, let's put it as a, a zero, plus S interaction, phi. Is my, this is quadratic. This is quadratic in phi. When that is not quadratic, it cannot but of this function here of this functional integral here. Because this is, is not Gaussian. No integrate to integrate Gaussians. Okay. So what I do then? I do the following, okay? I want to calculate this correlation function, for example. This is the one you have to calculate to calculate to, to obtain this scattering amplitude. It's a four-point function, but S here is interacting, has interaction. Perturbation theory, e to the i s is equal e to the i s int. Then you write this e to the i as zero, one plus i as int plus one half i as int square plus at nauseum. So this uh, uh, problem. Just did this. <laughs> this is for <laughs> You need more. Th you know, once you are, are here, three or four, then it requires some time to make all these fractions there, and not get lost. Okay, because many are repeated here. Okay, are equivalent. Then you have to find the combinatoric. Okay. It's not complicated, you see. So if I want to calculate an endpoint function, an endpoint correlation function, what you have to do, see, an endpoint correlation function, x1, xn, which is 1 over z okay so what is inside here are phi's right for example if this is minus lambda 
fattoria, fattoria och fattoria. This is a typical interaction, PowerPoint interaction. Okay, you see, this is what this is we just did it. Is the free function now? This times this, but ha what I have F n functions here and here. So how m this term is a function of x one. X n, X, X, X. Okay. Do I calculate integral now? I don't, but I do. With this. With this with this contraction okay there's another instead of with this it gives the same answer are repetitions because I can always change variable I have to integrate at the end of the day this integral here if I expand the numerator in powers, expansion in lambda, you see, is an expansion in the coupling. This is first order in the coupling, second order in the coupling, third order in the coupling, and so on and so forth. Okay? So then you get an expansion in the coupling constant. But you have to expand also the denominator. Okay? Because the correlation fall involves this z here. So you have to expand the numerator and the denominator. Okay. But then something weird happens. This is one contraction. But you see there are, there are these contractions. You see this one with this and this one with that and others only contracting the interaction you see so th th this first one that I draw was something like that you had x1 the yellow ones x1 with one x this is x x2 with x x3 with x x4 with x this is the first graph the first the yellow contractions gives that i should uh, draw it in the yellow to be very didactic you know? okay this is one of the graphs but this one in pink here X1. Now I have to use pink. X1 with X2. X3 with X4. And the X contracts with the X. And the X. If the. Uh, they are all contracted at X. You see? But they are disconnected from those. This is very weird. It seems that you have two, one, two going to three, four, okay? And something else is happening. But then the miracle happens. The denominator has only graphs of this kind because there are no external fields in Z. You see? In Z, this is not there. This is only in the numerator. In the denominator, you don't have those fields. So the no there is no dependence here in X1, X2, and Z. And what are the graphs that appear here? Precisely 
those and they cancel because you will you have to expand you have one minus lambda something and here one minus lambda something okay spanning lambda this is one minus lambda da 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 times one plus lambda something okay and this term here cancel the bad term that comes from there okay so you only have to worry in these contractions here in the weak contractions forget the denominator forget everything the only thing you have to contract are those connected the connected contributions are relevant only those are relevant you can prove this in full glory okay i will spend three hours to prove this exactly okay that the denominator cancels the disconnected graphs of the numerator so we are done now okay. we are back to the first class yeah to apply it to some momentum for that yeah i can yeah I can have a particle in the initial state, for example, A dagger K to the vacuum. Uh, this one particle with momentum K. And I can act what I want here. This A here. Yeah. Because this now you can write it as a phi something and then make the contractions. All right. So now you s you know scattering amplitude. Not quite yet, right? So coming back, I know to do this calculation analytically in perturbation theory. Okay. So for, for you can see here this probably probably will work this expansion will converge if lambda is very small okay so this is the case in quantum electrodynamics the majority of the processes are governed by the coupling constant which is very small okay and you can then use perturbation theory okay but there are occasions where you cannot use perturbation theory okay which is the case of strong interactions at low energies for example okay then you are not allowed to use this thing what you do then you 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 have to use tricks okay one of them is to put it back in the form of a perturbation calculation okay and an effective field theory calculation is essentially that it does okay that you are less as important for scale that you are interested okay and those then you calculate in perturbation theory you are essentially easy you are not perturbative problem perturbative problem okay it, it's like in quantum mechanics every time you can put back to the harmonic oscillator great because you can solve the harmonic oscillator analytically okay so the interest from the very first class, okay, we were interested in calculating the scattering amplitude. Okay, A, this is P1, P2, P3, P4. P1, P2, P3, P4, okay, which is saying that P1, P2, there, at the past inf infinity, say, 
and you are free. This is the string amplitude. So how to calculate that? Okay. There is one theorem that I will not prove. I will give the reference where you can look it up. Your guys, if the best I, I gave, you are able to prove that this theorem. It's called the LM theorem. That says that I P1, P2, P3, P4 is equal times 2 pi 4. I will explain everything now. I don't have time to explain that. But essentially what this is saying, the scattering amplitude is a four-point function. The Fourier transform of the four-point function that we just calculated here. Okay? So there is something written here, is something written here. It is on shell, and here it is amputated. I will, will explain what is that. Okay, so what you have to do, so let me define first what is this C here, make it more precise. There's a neat proof in this lecture uh, of this theory, reference on my notes. Okay. So what is this CP1, P3? This C, P1, P2, P4 is Okay, so to calculate the scattering amplitude, what you have to do, you calculate this correlation function the way I have shown here. Make all the contractions, the lowest order, I use only this term here, you make all the contractions, then you get products of the d's, of the okay, then you have to make Fourier transform. Then you get this answer for C, P1, P2, P3. Then what you have, you have to put all this momenta on. They conserve momentum here. Okay. This delta fun function will cancel, cancel from a delta function that appears here. Okay. On the right-hand side here, there will be a delta function that will cancel out this one. But there will be propagators associated with P1, P2, P3, P4. On those you have to cut out. It's essentially doing the following. This, 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 this. Then you cut out the propagator associated with that, propagator with that, propagator with that. So the answer will be a D, D, something here, D, D. Okay. This is what you get here. This is your exercise to do that. So this is you simply chop off. And this is your A. Okay. You have to do it so to see it. Okay, I don't have time to do it detailed. 
detailed here. Okay? But you have uh, now all the, the means of doing it. Okay? Fine. This one. So when you calculate this thing here, you get a four dimensional delta function that comes essentially from this Fourier transform. Okay? And for these that correspond to the this, 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 and this. And some other stuff here. So this L Lehman Zimanski Zimmerman theorem tells you that you have to annotate the set of theorem that you have to amputate. Okay? Take them off. And this then gives the scattering amplitude. Okay? For the case that the interacting Lagrangian is minus lambda or phi for the scattering amplitude A, P1, P2, P3, P4 is equal minus lambda. Isn't that neat? And this is the content of the first class, remember? That we have Lagrangian, one of the terms was given by that, and the scattering amplitude of one of was given by that, and that was, I think, G, right? Instead of lambda, was G. G. If the interacting Lagrangian is given by that, the lowest order amplitude on shell scattering amplitude is given by G. How you calculate it? As I just said, you calculate the four-point correlation function, use only this first term here, okay, and only the connected parts because the disconnected they cancel from the denominator, okay, and after you do it tonight, okay, because you need it for Sunday, so you <laughs> you do it tonight. It's doable. Okay? Got the principle. All right. So as I promised on Friday, or on Monday, that by Friday, you know how to calculate uh, the amplitude. Okay. To finish, let's come back to the first day. If you recall, we have ways to construct essentially right, two uses of, of effective field series. One is a top-down, and the other one is bottom-up. What is the top-down? Top-down, you know the theory, okay, which says is, is, is valid for all moment scales or length scales, okay, but you are interested in phenomena which are much below some cutoff, some value, okay? And then what you do? You integrate out the high scales, okay? So how you do that? One example was the one that I just gave on the first class, okay? I calculated the scattering amplitude, Okay, there are a bunch here, if you recall, that depend on a, a mass, okay, that is large. When you expand on that mass, this exercise you have to do, you know. There. It might appear very soon in your lives, okay. <laughs> you do that, and then you see that you have terms 1 over m squared, the they don't contribute. But if they are not infinite, but large, you can expand the scattering amplitude and remain only with the few terms here. They are constants, okay? You can up this into G and have an given only in terms of the phi field that reproduces precisely the result. And once you have a new Lagrangian, an effective Lagrangian, you can calculate other things. So you use for the scattering amplitude to match 
the new effective. You remember the first day, right? G effective will be G plus terms like 1 over M squared plus 1 over M bar squared, something like that. Okay? And the effective interaction will be G effective factorial by bar. Okay? Because y if you calculate the scattering amplitude with that, what gives it? G effective. And that gives. Okay. Then you use this Lagrangian now to calculate other things. But remember, only for phenomena below that scale we have expanded out here. So this is the top down. Uh, okay. Now, and what we have done here is just the matching. We have matched theory the high, uh, high energy uh, theory to the low energy and found the matching coefficient. Okay. Now, so the general principles for constructing a field theory, I, say I don't expect you understand every detail, okay? But, there are some guiding principles that you have to follow when you want to construct effective filtering. First, so these are the cons construction of an effective filtering. More details you will find on a reference I gave here. Line lectures from the, from the MIT from Ian uh, Stewart. So first thing you have to determine the relevant degrees of freedom. Okay. Just one example. You know that quarks and gluons exist. We have never seen them, but we know they, they in an indirect way. Okay. How do I with very high energy scattering experiments. I know that there, are some, there is something inside the proton, say. I'm not interested in very high energies. I'm interested in a low energy uh, scenario where I have only protons and neutrons or pions or some other particles. Are quarks and gluons relevant there? No. They might not be relevant. So my appropriate degrees of freedom to describe those processes are what? Pions, say. Okay. And so this determines what fields I'm going to use. Okay. Pion fields, not quite gluons, they are irrelevant. Okay. So you go even further. I want to study quarks and gluons. Do I need go to to string theory study quarks and gluons? Ah, perhaps. Okay. But for the scattering experiments at the I don't need that. QCD is enough. So QCD will be the effective field theory. Okay. You have to determine the relevant degrees of freedom that you believe are that are enough to describe your your phenomenon. That's not enough. You need to know the symmetries. Can you give one symmetry? Symmetry. If you are studying processes where happen, uh, where, where, where you have processes where particles move with velocity close to speed of light. Okay. Then you need the Lagrangian that you write with those fields must satisfy relativity. This is one symmetry. Another symmetry. Some internal symmetry has to conserve charge, electrical charge, because conservation of charge 
is a fundamental symmetry. Okay, it comes from a gauge symmetry. Okay. And so on. You, you, you have to respect the symmetries of your fundamental theory. Okay. You have to. Uh, so this essentially sets the interactions. Okay. Now you have to find an parameter. I only know to do uh, perturbation theory. I always to keep calculating information. This is the only thing I know to do it systematically. Okay, so I have to find a parameters. I by Lagrangian. This is in the front there. I will put a coefficient, a coupling, and that will be my expansion parameter, and it should be small. Small with respect to what? To the energies, momenta that I'm interested. Okay. Okay. So, in rough terms, this is what you have to do. Let's 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 construct one with a scalar field. I'm almost almost done. Suppose my relevant degrees of freedom are scalar fields. Okay. Let's write the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian is sum over n, cn of lambda, and operators that depend, and, 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 and products of fields. And these are coefficients. Okay? n is the mass dimension of the field of the operator. So what is the mass di dimension? Before entering that, we have to know how to, to evaluate the dimensions of the quantities. Okay. Mass dimension. What is the mass dimension of the mass? <laughs> it's one, right? So it's zero, right? Because it's I it has dimension of mass. Okay. I'm using h bar equal 1, c equal to 1. So h bar c is of the order of 200 MeV times Fermi. When h bar is 1 and c is 1, this is 1. It means what? I can measure energy in MeV or in Fermi's minus 1. So lengths are Fermi or MeV minus 1. Uh, in these units. Okay? So, e to the i s. What is the dimension of s? In principle, there is h bar here. This is dimensionless. The exponential of something and be dimensionless. So, what is the dimension of s? 1, right? So, it's dimensionless. When h bar of S, this means it's dimensionless. Okay. S have D forms. What is the dimension of that? L to the four. Or this is a mass minus four. For me? What is the mass dimension of that? Minus 4. Okay, so this has mass dimension n equal minus 4. Now look at this term here, which is in the Lagrangian. m square phi square d4 x. This has dimensions mass minus 4. This has mass and phi square. Okay? And so, um, I'm running out of time. I will give you the answer. You can work it out for yourself. Okay?
So this is mass four. So then you have, and this is the the action has mass to the zeros. So phi, the dimension of phi, the dimen mass dimension is one, and so on and so forth, right? So this has dimension of mass, the phi. Okay. A derivative, delta phi of x. X has dimensions of 1 over m. This has dimension of m, and this has dimension of m. So a derivative, the phi, has dimension 2. Okay? So these numbers here are those here. Okay? Now let's construct a Lagrangian and see if you agree with all the terms that I write. Can I have a constant in my Lagrangian? Why not? L is equal A0, sir. Can I have that? In principle, yes. Nothing. Okay. What is that? It's cosmological constant. Plus, can I have a term, say, Let's leave this for a while and think about this one. Can I have that one? Yes. What is A2? It's the mass. Okay, this term can be there. Can you have this one? In principle, yes, but not because it doesn't give a, a bound. Okay. Can I have a term like this one? A6 by 6. Yeah. In principle, yes. Can I have a term like D? Just the derivative of phi. A Lagrangian construction just from the derivative. Violates uh, asymmetry. This is the Lagrangian is a scalar field. It, it, it is a scalar. This is rubbish. I cannot have this. Okay. But I can have D2 that that it's okay. It respects all symmetries. Okay. Can I have this one? Yes, I can. And so on and so forth. I can have infinite terms here now. Okay? So what is the guiding principle where to stop? What is the guiding principle where to stop? Do I stop here? Okay, this one you can get rid by simply making a shift in the variable. So in the past, we make a shift and you can, in general, neglect that one. You don't. Okay? Okay, now, how, what is the guiding principle? Is this thing here. Okay, is the importance of each of these coefficients here with respect to, scale, to the scale I'm interested in? And how do I count the, the importance to these mass dimensions here? Okay, the higher the dimension, of these vectors here. This has to have dimension 4, always. There's no way. This has to have dimension 4. Okay? So if this has high dimension, because you have powers and powers of phi's here, this coefficient here has to have mass dimensions in the denominator to compensate the high dimension there. You see that? Okay? And this dimensionful parameter that I have here is usually associated with that cutoff I was talking about. Okay? This is the, the scale that is the upper scale, and I'm interested in physics below this scale. So this is the guiding principle then from a bottom up uh, procedure, for example. Top down too, but uh, this is more relevant for bottom up. You see this? What? dimension of this this operator here phi is dimension one so this has dimension square 
So mass is there. And this has dimension how much? The derivative, I had it here. The derivative is mass times mass is square is m four. So this had this operator here has dimension six. So this coefici coefficient here, d four, must be what? Some dimensionless quantity divided by to the six. So this should be suppressed. This thing here is suppressed compared to the other one, for example, this one. Okay? So this one is low dimensional, so this, for example, is m squared, my little Okay? This one, I forgot one here, you didn't mention, a4 by 4. Okay? As dimension 4. Dimension of dimensionless. This is G, say. This is dimensionless. Okay. In a okay, I did not talk about the formalization, I will not mention. Okay, so you this is the guiding principle of this effective filter that to follow. Not only that, there's a lot of detail and okay. But what counts is this expansion here that I have written here, okay, and this should be smaller and smaller when I increase the n here, okay. I simply don't have more time, I have to finish it, okay, but all the references I give you are wonderful lectures, online lectures and also written lectures that you can look at as a very accessible uh, level. Okay? I think I have to but the next class is already starting. Uh, you have questions? <laughs> we are back for us and some of you ask what I'm supposed uh, what I'm asking you on Sunday. Okay? On Sunday is essentially conceptual. Okay, all the questions are conceptual. Okay, you have to know what is 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 is, is what are the ideas behind an effective filter theory. There is one calculation that you have to done have to do, and if you do what I said here in the class, you will get it and you will go to Canada. <laughs> so you have questions. Uh, could you over could you go over again your last argument on why we neglect the first term and the third term and the seventh yes. term? So the the, the energy will not be uh, uh, okay because phi four it's okay when phi phi is negative phi four is like that. This is a potent potential energy, so this goes like that. You have a, mi a minimum of energy. Now, phi 3 is this. There is no minimum. It's not bounded from below. This one, you make a transformation here, a shift, and you can reabsorb in the coefficient. You don't need the inner term. There's a much fancy way to say it. You can normalize the source. And you know, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, wouldn't you be able to absorb the phi cubed into the phi fourth, for example? No, because uh, always shift. No, always do. They will remain that. There's no way to get rid of phi phi cube in general. Okay, thank you. And the a's cannot depend on phi. Okay. So What's the physical interpretation of an operator 
for example, of the derivative of phi to the fourth of, of the derivative of phi, of phi, the derivative to the fourth. Yeah, this will describe, you remember the first day we had the scattering amplitude and there were some potentials of P1 square plus or P1 plus P2 square or something uh, on the numerator. These are derivatives when you go to the coordinate space. Momenta are derivatives in coordinate space. So to reproduce these terms in the expansion of the scattering amplitude, you need derivatives here. Okay? You need, say, terms of this, this kind here. When you calculate three level diagrams with that, you reproduce the p squares here that are here. Okay? You see that or not? Yeah, you have momentum, you, the scattering amplitude depends on momentum. Okay? And you expand this out, you have P, P2 uh, or P3 there. You need three derivatives to, to get that term. Okay? This is interpretation. Derivative, a derivative expansion gives you the momentum that appears here in your scattering amplitude. Three level also give derivatives too. Higher order. Yeah. Then comes the issue that when you start contracting here, these fields here, okay, you can have graphs like tho those that I have x1 goes to x, and this goes to that, comes here, and you can have graphs like that. Okay, x2 and so on and so forth. What are those? Th those are integrals. Okay. What I have done here and what you I'm supposed you to do is only three level diagrams. You don't have this. These are divergent integrals. And there is where you need what is this magic thing of renormalization. They appear in higher order terms that we have not touched here. I think he was referring to higher derivatives, more than two derivatives, like four derivatives. But that that you was referring to? Or higher order terms in the expansion? But what he said, yeah, and you get higher powers of momentum. Because the first exercise I left you is there on the other page. Expand the amplitude to one, one over m to the six. Then you get powers of higher order here. And higher order of momentum at three level, at three level you need higher orders here. Higher that yeah. if you have force. Appreciate one time you get times p squared three times. P3, four times P4. You just saw it today. <laughs> How is this a time to learn? <laughs> Not an exercise. I will leave you an exercise for you then. Huh? These are all real physical theories. Beyond standard model physics, okay, beyond operators of, 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 of dimension 4, you have higher order derivatives here. So the effective field theory that we are seeking to beyond standard model physics involves terms here of higher order derivatives. They are non renormalizable in the usual sense, but are renormalizable in, 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 the, in the effective field sense. The fact that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. QED, non relativistic QED, when you take QED and expand, make the non relativistic, I have higher order terms there of derivatives. More questions?
Are you a coffee break? We'll have yeah. to start, uh, Dave, a little later already. But okay, yeah. go ahead. One more question. Um, well, and what do you mean with uh, integrating now heavy particles in the top um, approach? Is the one that we just did in the exercise. You All see, right. you we had that f two fields, phi and phi. Okay, at the moment that I have replaced oh. by the effective, degree, I got <laughs> I got rid of that. Yeah. And do it, take the path integral, the, the two fields, and per on this capital. Then I get an Lagrangian of this form here. With all those terms there, they start appearing conceptually in the practice. But when you integrate out this phi, okay, you get higher and higher order terms in these phi's. You have to perform the, the, the path integral. For that one that I gave you, you are able to do analytically. Those terms of this nature here. The, the mass dimension of D4 is not 6 but 2. There. This one? No, no, no. The D4. D6, I think. D4, yes. Yeah, you said that is lambda to the 6 and. A 6, yeah. Yeah, it's lambda to the 2. The 6, isn't it? No, I, I mean, the D4, the coefficient, should be dimension 2. Minus 2. Non minus six. Ah, because I okay, right, 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 right. Okay, let's thank uh, Gaston again. <laughs> there will be this afternoon, right, or not? Oh. I don't remember. Let it's planned. Yes, there, there is, uh, there is yeah. discussion in the afternoon. Yeah. Yes, there is, there is. Yes. Yeah, you can ask more questions in the discussion session. So, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, 10 minutes of cough break, then we start, uh, David. No, if you make perturbation theory, you don't, you, 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 you don't see. You, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it depends. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but is the uh, yeah yeah. You need it. Of course, the linear sigma model. Yeah, the linear sigma model has it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you truncate it here, then it's, it's gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. As long as you have other terms, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, right, right. right. And and if you mention to you, see the this. Yeah, if you make perturbation calculation. Yeah. 